Well, if you've joined us for the first time today, you have come on a good day because all Christ followers love Easter Sunday. It's a good news day. It comes after that fog of disappointment and the devastation of Good Friday has lifted to reveal the triumph and that sheer joy of the empty tomb. It is difficult for us to imagine how the disciples must have felt in those days of waiting between the crucifixion and the resurrection. Maybe that little clip that we've just shown uh, gives you something of the sense of what they might have felt when the news came through that the tomb was empty. History, I think, has something to offer us when we try and imagine just what it might have been like to experience that up and down roller coaster of emotion that the disciples and the followers of Jesus must have felt on that very first Easter. In late February 1851, Napoleon escaped from exile and he returned to the French mainland on the 1st of March and King Louis VIII sent unit after unit of troops out to try and stop him. But after meeting that old familiar face, one after the other, those units of troops threw down their arms and welcomed him back. Eventually, Louis VIII left Paris on the 19th of March, the day before Napoleon entered that capital. The Allies declared Napoleon to be the enemy and the disturber of the peace of the world. And they united to form a defensive alliance against him. Each of the nations that were part of that alliance provided 150,000 troops to the effort. And they committed themselves to keeping those troops on the field until Napoleon could be defeated. And the Duke of Wellington was chosen to lead the Allies into battle. Napoleon's army was now sizeable. And that now famous battle was held at a place called Waterloo in Belgium. Some of you might know it because a, a little unknown band wrote a song about it and they entered that song in the Eurovision Song Contest and the rest is, is history for them. Before that battle began, the Russian Tsar sent a message to the Duke of Wellington. His message read like this, it is for you to save the world again. Not much pressure in that, is there? It is for you to save the world again. Well, the battle ensued and those back in England waited for news of the outcome. Now, of course, in those days, there were no social media posts. There were no news outlets to get the news out rapidly. And so the people waited for semaphore signals to be disseminated from a ship which would come into the English Channel. Now, for those who aren't sure what semaphore signals are, they're a means of visual communication. They're usually done using flags where the letters of the alphabet are spelt out using different ways of holding the flags. It can also be done with lights or um, some other form of signal. But they need to be easily visible. And for them to be effective, they need to be um, shown from somewhere that can be readily seen uh, by a lot of people. And this is how the news was transmitted from town to town. At a high point, these signals would be made and it would, the signals would be transmitted to the next high point. And so in England, all eyes were turned to the top of Winchester Cathedral, straining to interpret the signal as it came through. W, E, L, L, Wellington defeated. And the mood became sombre. And as if to illustrate their mood, one of those thick, heavy British fogs rolled in and blanketed the town. Well, the news that the war had been lost spread throughout England. 
despair like that fog blanketed the hearts and minds of the people as they began to make plans, many of them, to set sail for America. And then the fog began to lift. And it, as it lifted, it revealed that there were actually four words to that communication, not three, not two. Wellington had defeated the enemy. And you can imagine how things changed when the full message had been broadcast. It didn't take long for the good news to spread throughout the land. Good news travels fast, doesn't it? And what had seemed like certain defeat was instead triumphant victory. Despair was replaced with enthusiastic hope. Sorrow was replaced by instant joy. And so it must have been on that very first Easter as that news came back from the cross that Jesus was dead. Here was the one that they had been waiting for, the promised Messiah, God's anointed chosen one, the one who would deliver his people. And here he was, seemingly defeated. He was dead on that cross. Imagine the confusion and the despair that must have hung over those followers of Jesus as they tried to come to terms with just what had happened. And then the second part of that important message comes through when the women return from the empty tomb in the garden. Jesus wasn't defeated. He'd risen again. Jesus had defeated the enemy. And that is the good news that we celebrate today as we remember, as we celebrate together, the miracle of the resurrection and as we embrace just what that means for us. You know, immediately before the crucifixion, the soldiers had mocked Jesus. They dressed him in a purple robe, the colour of royalty. And they twisted together a, a crown of thorns, like the one out the front here. And they placed it on his head, mocking him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they were, of course, being ironic, because in their minds, this beaten, bruised and bloodied figure before them looked no more like a king than did a common beggar off the streets. Little did they know that in just a few days, this man that they would put to death would rise from the grave victorious to be seated at the right hand of God as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Not just the King of the Jews, but King, Prophet, Priest, Saviour and Lord of all. Well, that purple robe was later removed and Jesus' clothes were put back on him. He was led out to be crucified. Pilate was the governor of the Roman province of Judea at that time and he was the official who had presided over one of the trials of Jesus and had somewhat reluctantly sent him to be crucified. Pilate had a note prepared, a placard to be fastened to the cross. And that note was written in three languages, John's Gospel tells us, Aramaic, Latin and Greek. And it said simply, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, the chief priests of the Jews didn't like that one little bit. And they protested to Pilate, demanding that the sign be amended to read, this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. But Pilate responded simply, what I have written, I have written. Strange, isn't it? 
that a Roman governor could have more insight into who this man Jesus was than did the religious leaders of the Jews at the time. They had all of the Old Testament record of scripture that pointed in many ways to Jesus the Messiah. And yet when he came, they failed to recognize him. Well, in our Easter series here, we have explored a number of Old Testament figures whose lives have foreshadowed or pointed to the saving work of Jesus Christ. And today we come to David. Now David is most famously known for, for the Sunday school story, David and Goliath, that was uh, read to you by Pastor Glenn. And you might well be thinking, well, David and Goliath is a strange choice for Easter Sunday. But it's not so strange when you consider the giant that was brought down for us by the saving work of Jesus on the cross. He makes Goliath look like child's play. And just as we have seen for Adam and for Isaac and for Moses, in so many ways, the life and work of Jesus on our behalf at the cross is prefigured in the life of David and then some. Now we first come across David in 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 14. King Saul has disobeyed the Lord and the kingship is about to be stripped from him. God will take it from him and he's going to hand it to another. And that other of course is David who was described as a man after God's own heart. It would be David that God would appoint as king and ruler of his people. And when you really stop to look, there are so many parallels between the life of David and that of Jesus that it is almost uncanny. And if we were to explore each one, we would be here all day. And I know that nobody wants that, especially not on Easter Sunday. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to whet your appetite for some of these similarities. Just a few snippets. Now, each one on their own doesn't amount to much, but when you consider them in their entirety, I think they leave little doubt that, yes, David does indeed foreshadow Jesus Christ. And then once we've established that, we're going to have a look at what I would call the big five, the really important ones. And we're going to look at them with an eye, not just to the ways in which the life of Jesus parallels that of David, but to the way the life of Jesus exceeds that of David as the true and better David. So are you ready? We're going to move through these very, very quickly. So hang on tight. We're going to start with something easy. Birthplace. Where were these men born? Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So was David. David was the son of Jesse, who was the grandson of Ruth and Boaz. Now the prophet Isaiah speaks of David as being the root or a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And what he means by that is that the Messiah would come from the remnant of David or Jesse's family line, even when it seemed like there was no hope left there. Just a hidden root or a lifeless looking stump. And if you look at the genealogy of Jesus in the beginning of the book of Matthew, you will indeed see King David listed there and you can follow that line right through to Jesus. So that was an easy one. Both men were beloved. The name David means beloved and at Jesus' own baptism, God declared, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Both men were mocked by their brothers. David before defeating Goliath 
uh, and Jesus before defeating sin and death on the cross. Both men's brothers then joined them. David's brothers joined him. Jesus' brothers joined in his mission and were leaders in the early church. Both men were betrayed by a close and trusted friend. David by Absalom, who sought to take the kingship from him, and Jesus by Judas. And this is where it starts to get uncanny. Both of their friends who betrayed them later went out and hung themselves in remorse. A couple more. David was chosen by God. Jesus was sent by God. David was anointed by Samuel and the Spirit of God came upon him. Jesus was baptised by John and the Spirit descended on him. David began his reign at 30 years of age. Jesus began his ministry, the bringing in of the kingdom of God at age 30 years of age. Neither man was what the people expected. David was the eighth son of Jesse. When Samuel was sent to uh, anoint the new king, he started with number one. You start with the oldest and he worked his way down until he thought there were no more sons. David was the last pick. And Jesus was not what men expected the Messiah to be. A baby coming in a manger to a virgin girl was not the kind of Messiah that people were looking for. Finally, both men were Jews who attracted to themselves Gentiles. 2 Samuel 15, 17 to 22, you'll see that about David. And of course, we're all here because Jesus has attracted to himself the Gentiles. Now, all of these are interesting facts for those who like that sort of thing. Uh, interesting, thought-provoking, but do any of them really matter? And the answer to that question, in case you're wondering, should be no. It's interesting that the life of Jesus parallels in so many ways the life of David, but it doesn't really matter because the world did not need another David. As great a leader of the people that David was, as great in battle as he was, as astounding as his victory over Goliath was, the world did not need another David. It needed a saviour. And so what really matters today is not the ways in which Jesus and David are similar, but the ways in which they differ. Let me give you five. Number one, David, although a man after God's own heart, was not perfect. Only Jesus was. Now the Bible presents a very honest picture of David. Clearly, we are supposed to know about his failings. Many of his sins are recorded, the most well known, of course, being the time that he looked out from his palace and saw the young woman Bathsheba bathing and he wanted her. And so he sent for her. And then later on, he had her husband killed. David was able to conquer the giant Goliath, but he was no match for Satan. He repeatedly succumbed to temptation and he couldn't even deal with his own sin, let alone that of other people's. David was a man after God's own heart, but Jesus was God incarnate. God 
with flesh on. That's what that word means. You think of chili con carne. God incarnate means God with flesh on. Sent from heaven to do the Father's will. One with the Father in every respect. Now, after Adam succumbed to temptation in Eden, Jesus would be the only one to walk this earth without sin. And therefore, he would be the only one who was capable of bringing down that greater giant, Satan, on behalf of all of God's people. David didn't begin his life as a giant slayer. He began as a mere shepherd boy who tended to his father's sheep out on the hills, protected them with that slingshot that he became so proficient in that he was able to use it to bring down Goliath. He protected them from wild lions and from bears and he led them to food and water. And he used those skills that he had learned out there with the sheep as a leader of God's people, Israel. Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd, the one who takes care of his sheep. His people are his sheep. He provides for them and he watches over them and he leads them in the right way to go and he is the gate for the sheep. At night time, ancient shepherds used to gather their sheep in a, a walled off area or an area that was protected by prickle bushes or something like that. And after leading the sheep inside, the shepherd would lie across the opening to ensure that nothing untoward could come in, that the wolves or the lions or the bears would be kept outside. So the shepherd became the gate for the sheep. And the sheep that went through would be safe, protected there by the shepherd. And what David did in a physical sense for those sheep, Jesus, the true and better David, does in a spiritual sense for his people. We are his flock, those who enter through him, who accept his call on their lives, who repent, will be forgiven and will be saved. There is no other way. There's only one gate, and Jesus is it. Now, David was a man of great faith. He was committed to following God and to keeping the commands of God. At times, he failed spectacularly, but he would always repent and return to God seeking his forgiveness. He was a good and godly king. And under his leadership, God's people prospered. On their behalf, he fought and won many battles. But the blood that he shed was not his own. So much bloodshed, bloodshed of other people, prevented David from building the house of the Lord. David said to his son Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, but this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you've shed much blood on the earth in my sight. David's son Solomon would later build the physical temple for God because but unlike David, the blood that Jesus shed would be his own. He offered himself up as a perfect sacrifice for sin. He shed his own blood to make us an everlasting kingdom, a temple for God by releasing us from our sins so that we might become that kingdom, priests, to God, our Father. You read that in Revelation 1, 5 to 6. So we have become that dwelling place for God because Jesus was willing to shed his own 
blood. Now, King David, as I've said, is widely credited as being the greatest of all of the kings of Israel. He reigned for 40 years and then he died, like everybody else. And the record of his reign finishes at that point. But Jesus lives. That is what we're celebrating today. That's the message of the empty tomb. His reign will not only last forever, but it would extend far and wide beyond Israel to include even the likes of us. And so today we celebrate his victory. The enemy has been defeated and we are free in Christ to enjoy all that he has for us. And we know this because of the folded grave clothes, because of the empty tomb. Death and sin no longer have any hold on those who call upon the name of Jesus. And that is something worth celebrating. Let me conclude with one final illustration of just what Jesus has done for us. Imagine the terror of a young child with an anaphylactic allergy to bee stings. The child is travelling in the car when suddenly a bee is blown in through the partly open window. And you know what happens when a bee comes into a car with small children. There's lots of chaos, there's lots of screaming and swatting and flapping and the driver's trying madly with one hand to do something about shooing the bee out the window. There's nowhere for the bee to go and the bee is becoming more and more agitated and so is the child with the anaphylactic reaction. At this point, a parent has to do what a parent has to do and so the father reaches over from the driver's seat and grabs the bee in his hand and squashes it within his fist. Imagine the child's panic when the father turns his hand over and releases the bee back into the car. Sensing the young boy's panic, the father again reaches across the car, this time with his palms open, pointing at the wound on his palms. There stuck in the skin of his palm is a stinger from that bee. Do you see this? He says to the young boy. You don't need to be afraid anymore. I've taken the sting for you. And isn't that just what Jesus has done for us? Those six words, I've taken the sting for you. They sum up Easter in a nutshell. Our king has taken the sting for us. Now, that doesn't mean those old enemies, sin and death and Satan are no more. They're still buzzing around trying to do their thing. But they no longer have any hold over those who call upon his name. So we don't need to be afraid. Our king has borne for us the consequences of our sin. And we stand in his righteousness before God because he has been raised. We know that we will too if we put our faith in him. That is the happy, triumphant, joyful news of Easter Sunday. If God's Holy Spirit has been speaking to you today or at any time over this Easter weekend, drawing you to himself, please don't ignore him. Speak with someone this morning in this place before you go home today. We have some copies of the scriptures out in the foyer on the table just around the corner. They're there in a number of languages. So if English is not your first language, don't let that be a problem to you either. You're welcome 
to take one if you would like to take the scriptures and to read the accounts of Jesus' death and resurrection for yourself and pray, asking God to reveal himself to you. Can I assure you that if you do that, he will not let you down? Let's close in prayer together. Lord God, on this happy day, our cry echoes the angels in heaven who sing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. We bow before you as King of kings and Lord of lords and the only one who could secure victory on our behalf. We worship and adore you, giving thanks for all that you have done.